For nearly 30 years, Chris Framey guided the planning of the University of Oregon's campus. He talks about the influence of Christopher Alexander's 1975 book, The Oregon Experiment. When I arrived on campus in, in 1989, um, they were still, we were, we did not have a, an accepted campus plan. We were using the Oregon Experiment as sort of a loose guide for how we did planning and a whole host of institutional practices and policies that had grown up over the years that my predecessor had put together. He had only built about half a dozen buildings in 15 years. So there was almost nothing going on on the campus, which meant you didn't really need to worry about master planning at that scale very much. So in 91, we began to codify what was more of a framework plan uh, that took the ideals of the Oregon experiment and put them into a practical application. Um, two of those, it was readily evident that two of those principles were, were revolutionary for 73 and that we were going to keep as much as possible. Uh, one of those was the idea of participation and the idea that the end user would really be in the room with the architect and we would go beyond user engaged design and try to get to user directed design. And patterns are, are uh, verbal descriptions, sometimes accompanied with a little diagram mm -hmm. that describe a design problem, something that comes up in the world, uh, and then des describes a solution for that problem. And if you'll notice carefully, the book, also about patterns, is called A Pattern Language. Yes. It's not called THE Pattern Language. Right. So Chris never thought, and Linda, in talking to him later, he never thought that that was the end of the world. And in fact, at, at when we got better at it, we realized that we could write our own patterns. And so we did that. And in our current plan, which was adopted in 2005, which is, is really a framework plan, um, it really in, includes a lot of probably about, oh, I'd say it's probably two thirds from, from either a pattern language or the organ experiment, and about a third of the patterns in that master plan from 2005 are ones that we have created over time. And then each user group typically creates half a dozen of their own patterns, which reflect directly problems they see in front of them and solutions to those problems in their own words, uh, and sometimes with the help of a diagram of one of our staff members. It's more of a suggestion. It's a guideline. And so the way, the way that works is that each, each design team, each professional designer, has to discuss those with their users. And together, they decide whether they're going to implement them or not. And sometimes during that discussion, they come up with another idea. So again, a library, as, as a, uh, one of the key patterns is about hearth and yes. community building yes. and bringing people together. And what does that mean? And that's really important at a campus in particular. Mm -hmm. Well, the librarians are like, well, we don't want a bunch of people together talking in the library. That's not librarian-like. That doesn't make sense to us. So the suggestion was, well, let's step back a scale. Let's think about the library itself and what does it mean to the campus? Oh, well, the library really is the heart for the whole campus. Well, yes, it is. So how could we move forward with that idea? And the practical solution that came out of that was, let's light the building at night. Let's be sure we use its historic entrance because it's off of the quadrangle because the original idea was to have another entrance in the back. And they thought, no, wait a minute, if we're the hearth, we need the most important part on the campus, and we're going to light that at night to show off how important we are and create a heart for the whole campus. Yeah. Coordination was the idea that there be a central campus planning committee right. um, so that each user group wasn't allowed to, to go off and one group would be red and one would be blue, that these would be coordinated. And the way we, we institutionalized that was the planning committee is put in place um, to do just that. All projects run through the planning committee, planning committee recommends to the president, and the planning committee's task is to be sure they're consistent with the campus plan. But the major thing that we've done is understanding the context of the university and its place in history, and the fact that something did come before us, and how do we take that, the sort of three-dimensional essence of that campus, and expand it and protect it as we go forward and make these changes. Now, the, mm -hmm. it wasn't actually an issue of cost that was killing the, the pretty picture. The issue was not understanding what the future was like. And so you keep make the pretty picture for the next 10 years, and at year two, it's on the shelf because you've changed your minds. 
Higher education changes direction so quickly that you can't predict something that's going to take you that far out reasonably, reliably. So what we've done over time is realize, well, no, that armature, that open space, that look and feel of the campus, that's what we want to pr protect. And in fact, our campus plan actually describes where you cannot build. It does not describe where you can build. It describes where you cannot build. And then everything left over is a potential building site. Um, and, and as we've had more time and energy over the years, we've gotten more and more specific about what that means. But it's a sort of up, upside down. It's like, we're not going to tell you where you can build, we're going to tell you where you cannot build. And that's all about preserving the essence of the American campus, its best to our nature, its relationship of open spaces and pedestrian ways, and, and our campus, very mature landscapes and trees. So all of these things um, come together in what we now call a framework plan. So these ideas, which was something else, can sometimes change into another kind of expression of the built form um, that were not what was anticipated originally. But it happens because there's a dialogue. Language is put in place between a designer and the end user, and the two of them come together to create architecture. That user directed that idea that we were letting the users pick their own mm -hmm. architects. So, wow, that, well, we can never yeah. do that. And I said, we have to understand our culture. So it works well for our culture. And aspects of it may work well in other cultures. But planning at its base it is a reflection of the moral, morals, the way culture, the way societies, subcultures make decisions. If, you, if your planning process doesn't reflect how your group makes decisions and is comfortable making decisions is not going to be a good match. So for us, it worked great because everybody wants to be in the room and sure. be part of those decisions and right. yet we've got to make progress. We've, we've developed right. a system. So where other campuses have that same idea where other people want to be engaged mm -hmm. to that level, yes, I'd say this is a really good system for that. There are aspects of it that port across all campuses, um, but the particular Chris Alexander pieces of it about participation, why that's important, mm -hmm. and patterns, how we get the designers mm -hmm. and the users to talk to each other, mm -hmm. those are great tools. But you got to be sure that that's what your particular culture wants. Yeah. This conversation was recorded June 28, 2016 in Seattle, Washington.